My dear respected brothers and sisters, we are still continuing our series of khutbah entitled Immigration and Integration, Al Hijra wal Indimaj. And we are trying to cover in this series the most important strategic work, strategic work of our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions over the course of 10 years in the Medina. 10 years in the Medina. The work in building the Muslim community identity, the work of da'wah and integrating and uh, reform in all aspects of life, such as the moral, social, educational, intellectual, political, economic, health, environment, media, etc. And also we will see how the Prophet ﷺ was interacting with all the different groups of the Medina society, Muslims and non-Muslims, while he balanced the preservation of Islamic identity, al-hiqab, al-haliya islamiya, and citizenship, well more. My dear respected brothers and sisters, in my last two khutbah, I covered the Medina's health reform, al-islah, al-sahi, the Medina. And we discovered how the Prophet ﷺ, he tackled and solved the Medina's fever uh, previously. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we will continue our series by covering the eighth strategic project, eighth strategic project from this series that the Prophet ﷺ, he carried out in building the Muslim community identity. This project is what I call the Medina's environmental reform. Al-Islah al-Bi'i al Medina. The Medina environmental project actually started side by side with the health project. If you recall, we mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ, in his approach uh, to solve the complicated issue, the health issue in the Medina, he uh, used four aspects. We talked about he used a multi-solution, uh, uh, multi-dimensional solution. And to simplify explaining that, we said that divided to four sectors. And one of the significant sectors that we covered was the environmental hygiene. So that's related to the uh, environmental reform. And that was the initiation for the environmental reform uh, project in the Medina. We mentioned, if you recall, that in this sector, the Prophet ﷺ, how he appointed one of the companions, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, who was an expert in water flow to enhance the water flow in Wadi Badhan, the valley of Badhan, and all the other valleys. As Umun Aisha, she described when she came to the Medina, she said that when she came to the Medina, she said, we came to the Medina, and it was one of the most diseased land, and Badhan Valley was running with a dirty water. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he was focusing on solving this specific issue, and he dedicated one of the Sahaba, the companions, to do that. Also, we saw how the Prophet ﷺ, part of the environmental hygiene, he forbade the Muslims to urinate in the water resources, the side of the roads, and uh, the shades, where he called it the three curses, and that was the culture at that time. Prophet said, Beware of the three curses, urinate in the water resources, the side of the roads, and the shades. Also, as an alternative, he designated more specific open areas, more specific open areas to use as a public washrooms, areas for men and other areas for women. Because 1400 years ago, 
there were no washrooms at homes at that time, in homes at that time. Also, we saw how the Prophet ﷺ, he urged the Muslims to clean their houses, yards, public areas, and, and the roads. And that to spread the cleanness uh, culture in the Medina. Because we mentioned that as the bad culture and attitude is contagious, also the good attitude and culture is contagious too. Where he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Allah Jalina Yuhibu Janal, in Allah, in Allah Jalina Yuhibu Janal, Tayyibun Yuhibu Tee, Nadifun Yuhibu Nadafa, Tanadifu Afiniyatikum. In Sahih Muslim. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is beautiful and loves beauty, good and loves good, and clean and loves cleanness, so clean your courtyards. And uh, regarding the public roads, also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, uh, that the Iman and the faith is some and 70 branches. The lowest branch of the Iman is removing the, the harm and the dirt from the road. All these previous steps that we mentioned it was part of what we call the uh, environmental hygiene. But as I mentioned, it was the beginning. It was the beginning of a comprehensive environmental reform project that was led by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I will try in this limited time of the khutbah to give you some of the main aspects, just touches on the main aspect that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tackled. And I will divide it to three areas. What the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did regarding the land and plant. What the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in the Medina regarding the water. And also regarding the animal. So three aspects, inshallah, three areas. But before covering that, I need to start first with the definition. We need to define what is environment, what I mean by environment. And I would like also, while I'm defining the environment, to highlight the Islam principles toward the environment in that specific definition. The environment, to my humble understanding and reading uh, in the Book of Islam, it means all, this, all that surrounds the human being from land, water, and atmosphere. All that surrounds the human being from land, water, and atmosphere. And also it includes the living organism, organisms, such as the plants and, and the animals, and the non-living things, such as the rocks, mountains, valleys. And the way that we look at it, that all that is creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the human being to use, to use wisely. This is part of the definition. definition. To use it wisely to obtain the necessities of life, such as the food, clothing, medicine, shelter, and energy. This is how we define it. Now, some of, some of you will ask, where did you get the principle that everything is created on the earth for the human being to, to use? I will tell you that I got this from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentioned in the Quran, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا That he, it, 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 it was he who created all that on the earth for you. Also, the other principle that the human being is responsible for that environment, to use it wisely. Where I got that? Also, I got it from the Surah Al-Baqarah, where uh, uh, clearly it indicated the role of Khilafah, that Allah entitled the human being with it, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said to the Malaika, if qala rabbuka li malaikati inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, that when your Lord said to the angels, to the angels, that I am putting a khalifa, a successor, successor on the earth. Then the principle that the human being is responsible, responsibility not to spread corruption in the land and also to use these type of resources wisely. I got it from another ayah from Surah Al-Qasas where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, al -ard, inna Allah la That do not see corruption in the land where Allah does not love those who, does, who do this. So in brief, this is how we define the environment, and these are some of the principles uh, related to the environment, and these are the expected role of the human being toward, toward it in Islam. This is how we see it in Islam. So let's move to the first area that of the environmental reform that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi did regarding the land and uh, the plant. We mentioned earlier that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam urged the Muslims to clean their houses, their yards, public areas, and roads, to spread the clean culture in the Medina environment. Then he وسلم, moved to another area where he fought the desertification, desertification, in several ways. And one of them is that he urged the Muslims to plant more in the deserted valleys and lands. 
any deserted valleys and lands to plant in the Medina. The Prophet ﷺ, he initiated that project by the hadith, Man ahya biha. The meaning of the hadith, that whoever revived a dead land that does not belong to anyone, then he has the right to own it, as narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. And as a result of that, a significant farm from this hadith, a significant farming operation began in the Medina, and followed by a movement to revive the neglected agricultural lands and valleys. And subhanAllah, from this hadith, many valleys, they started to agriculture a lot of valleys that was neglected at that time, such as uh, uh, Wadi Al-Aqiq, Qana, and Ramuna. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the Medina, just the famous valley at that time was uh, Batham. But immediately within a few months, with this hadith, all the Sahaba and the companions, they started to uh, do agriculture on these three major valleys. Also, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the agriculture because of its essential and direct effects on the nutritional and ecological balance of life. When he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, لا يغرس المرء غرسا لا يغرس المرء غرسا ولا يزرع زرعا فيأكل منه إنسان ولا دابة ولا شيء إلا كانت له صدقة If a Muslim plants anything a charity or a صدقة will be count for him when a person, when another person, when a person or an animal or anything eats from it and subhanallah over here anything so you are talking about something less than the animal which is the insect even the, uh, the fungus and other stuff, it will be counted as sadaqa for you. So this is part of the nutritional and the ecological balance that the Prophet ﷺ, he urged the Muslims to do it. And you will be rewarded for it. Also Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said in another amazing hadith, which means that if the hour comes, the hour in over here means if the death, that now you gonna die. Okay, if the death comes to you, or the day of judgment, you are seeing the day of judgment, and you have a plant, a seedling, a seed is a seedling, a small plant in your hand, the Prophet is ordering you to plant it. This hadith gives us a lot of meanings over here. One of the teach the hadith that teaches us over here the productivity in the Muslim's life should not stop. Until then. Also, I learned from this hadith, it teaches us the importance of planting and preserving the environment, growth, and development. Even if the human do not benefit from it, you're gonna die. So you're not gonna take the benefit directly from it. Or even if you won't live to see the results. So it's simply with this type of hadith, the productivity and the environmental maintenance culture that Islam wants to implant actually in every Muslim mind. Islam is not looking only on the plant. He wants to implant these type of cultures in the mind of the Muslims. On the other hand, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ strictly forbid cutting any fruitful trees without a valid reason. He said ﷺ, Do not cut down trees, for it protects the animals in, its dry, in, in the dryness. Even during the war, the order, yani, order uh, yani, were issued explicitly to the Muslim leader forbidding them from cutting down the trees and destroy them during the wars. And we can take that from the advice of Abu Bakr Siddiq who used to give to the commander of his army who went to Asham. He said to him, Inni ولا تخربن عامرا ولا تعكرن شاة ولا بعيرا ولا إلا لمأكلا ولا تحرقن نخلا ولا تغرقنه ولا تغرل ولا تجبر So, and I advise you with 10 things Do not kill woman or a child or an older man Do not cut fruitful trees Do not sabotage the buildings Do not slaughter sheep or camel except for food These type of morals during war this type of advice, Abu Bakr is saying it to the commander that he sent it to Hashem. Do not burn down palm trees, do not burn or drown palm trees, do not take, do not rape or act cowardly. Yani, la tablul wa la These are the Islamic ethics in war. So what about peace? 
more than that. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was one of the first people who established what we call the environmental reserve, the mahmiyat al where the trees are not where we are not whose yani, trees are not allowed to be cut down or the animals to be hunted, and those areas will provide an opportunity for the plants, for the animals, uh, and the birds to reproduce. As narrated on the hadith regarding Mecca and Medina, and I will talk about two of them, Mecca and Medina, we have what we call Har, which is actually a preserved area, via Mahmiya, Mahmiyat Bi'iyya. Regarding Mecca, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna Allah haram Mecca ta yawma khalaq as-samawati wal-ard, fahi haram ila yawm al-qiyama, la yu'udhabu shajaruha, wa la yunfaru sayduha, wa la yu'udhabu lakhtatuha, wa la yu'udhabu lakhtatuha illa munshid. It's a long hadith, the general meaning of the hadith, that all people Allah made Mecca forbidden on the day of judgment that he created the heaven and the earth and it's forbidden until the day of judgment no one cut its tree and no one hunts its animals or birds until the end of the hadith and th this is, has been done at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel and he taught Ibrahim the places, the, the, the boundaries of the haram in Mecca and then this has been actually uh, confirmed and renewed by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he showed the Sahaba the areas and it's un non, non symmetrical regarding the Mecca business from Kaaba you are talking about the shortest one is at Tanaim around 7 kilometers from Kaaba another area which is the farthest one is Arafah you are talking about 20 kilometers from Kaaba uh, from uh, the side of Jeddah we are talking about al Jurana, around 18 kilometers al Hudaybiyah from the other side, 16 kilometers, about 12 kilometers. So, not symmetrical regarding that area from Al Kaaba. Then the Prophet ﷺ, when he moved to Medina, when he moved to Medina, he made the Medina also an environmental reserve. And he said in the famous hadith, uh, The Medina was located between Haratayn. So I forbid what is between the two parts of the Medina. The two parts, basically, if you go to the Medina, you will find on the two sides of the Medina a volcano rocks, black rocks, on the two sides. So the Prophet ﷺ, he used them as the boundaries. So you are talking about from the mosque of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, from all the directions, you are talking about 21 kilometers. From all the directions, this is the Haram. This is a reserved area that is forbidden to hunt or to uh, remove any type of plants, or to, to cut the plant, the trees. So this is, these are types of, the, how the Prophet ﷺ, he did a type of uh, environmental reform from the land and the plant. Now let's move to the second area, which is the water uh, environment reform. And regarding the water environment reform, there are two areas the Prophet ﷺ, he tackled. The first one is protecting the water from pollution, and the second one, is reserve, preserving the water resources from depletion and waste. So regarding the first one, the first point, which is protecting the water from pollution, I think we covered that at the beginning of our khutbah, when we, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, اتقوا الملاعن الثلاث الغاز في الموارد وقاعدات الطريق وطل beware of the three curses, urinate in the water resources, the side of the roads and the sheets. And the water pollution nowadays is no longer just the urine. It's much more complicated than the urine, urine. Rather, there are more dangerous materials. Nowadays, they have more significant impact on the and, and pollution of, of the water resources, such as the industrial residues, the poisonous chemical materials, oil, radioactive residues. These type of materials, they have a higher threat to the marine and the human life. Regarding the second point, which is preserving the water resources from uh, depletion and waste. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he urged the Muslims not to extract the extract, extract, extravagant, and la, yani, al -israf, not to extravagant with the water, which is not to exceed the norm of using the water. Even if you are using it in performing ibadah, such as the wudu. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once he passed by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and he saw Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, a uh, companion, was making wudu, bruja. So he said, what is this istramagat, O Sa'ad? Ma hadha al-isaf, ya Sa'ad? So he said, is in wudu extravagant, O Prophet? Yani, this is ibadah, I'm doing extra, as if he's taking more reward from Allah because he's doing more, more water and cleaning thoroughly. So he said, yes, even if you are in a flowing, in a flowing river, 
حتى نعبد إن كنت على نهر الجاب. So Islam over here focuses on building the culture of non-excessiveness, كراهيه الإصلاح. And especially we need that that concept and that type of control when you have abundance of these type of resources. You don't need that when you don't you have lack of resources. The issue is to have this type of control when you have abundance of resources. And we must practice that concept over here in Canada. When we are, subhanAllah, over here we are in our Arabic rivers. Especially with the youth, when they take showers. MashaAllah, yani some of them when I hear the, 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 the shower uh, sound as if uh, it's a Niagara Falls. Yani, uh, a lot of it's coming out. So one of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give put us upon us over here in Canada of the abundance of water. So do not waste it and use it responsibly. And this is one of the practical forms of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this bounty. And he will yani, make it last for us for a long time. The third and the final element is the animal environmental reform. And uh, you know, as Muslims over here, we are not religiously obligated to be vegetarian. We eat meat as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted us to uh, slaughter. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he forbid slaughter and kill the animals without a goal, without a reason. In the hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man qatala asfura, man qatala asfura, فما فوقها بغير حقها سأله الله عز وجل عن قتله عن قتله قيل يا رسول الله وما حقها قال أن يذبحها فيأكل فيأكلها ولا يقطع رأسها فيرمي بها. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said in the hadith whoever kills a bird or a buzzard from the animals without without its right Allah سبحانه وتعالى will hold them accountable at the day of judgment. So the Sahaba they ask the Prophet what is its right? So the Prophet Sallallahu he said to slaughter and eat it, not to cut off its head and throw it. So you see over here, there is no room for playing in the life of the animals and killing them without a legitimate goal. Also, the kindness to the animals is essential in Islam. And I believe a lot of you remember the hadith of the lady that she entered and she has been punished in the hellfire because she uh, captivated a cat and she imprisoned it until it died. Neither she fed it uh, or watered it uh, while uh, when she detained it, nor it let it eat from the nature, leave it and let it eat from the nature. Also, we saw also the another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he talked about the man, he entered the Jannah because he uh, um, um, watered uh, a, a dog until it quenched from thirst, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him for that specific deed. Also, if you look in the Quran, a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored actually some of the animals by uh, calling some of the surahs in the Quran with their names, such as Al-Baqarah, Al-An'am, Al-Nahl, Al-Naml, Al-Ankabud, Al-Feel. So all these tells you about uh, the, uh, the, the way that we look at the animals. Also, there is another Yani a big sector about the ethics on dealing with the animals even when you kill it. And because of the time, I can't yani, come up that. My dear respected brothers and sisters, all that I mentioned over here from the environmental reform in the three areas regarding the land and path, the water and the animals, is just the tips of the iceberg that we have in our religion. Our religion, Islam, is teaching us and is a practical, profound, and a balanced religion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it's a teaching for our life, and it gives us that type of balance in our life. Because it's revealed from Allah Almighty, who is the creator of all this universe in an accurate way. Our religion that we need over here, we need to learn it, to revive it, and to revive the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and to act upon it, and to be proud with our unique Islamic identity. أسأل الله عز وجل أن يوفقه كان في ديننا وأن يجعلنا من يبيون سنة نبينا في جميع قلوب المسلمين على طاعته ونصر دينه ومن من يشرح في كل أمورهم كتاب الله وسنة رسوله إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا وأقوز المستغفر الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ومن سار على نجيه مهتدى بسنته مهدم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد 
my dear respected brothers and sisters, as usual, I will proceed the subject of my khutbah with uh, about the Medina's environmental reform, with a set of lessons learned, recommendations, and even some of the proposed projects related to the khutbah in a way to transfer them this type of abandoned meanings and sunnas, and to move it from the theoretical dimension to the practical reality. And what comes into my own mind over here? First of all, on the individual level, we need to start with the paradigm shift, the way that we view the subject of the environmental report. We, where we should view it as a significant issue. Uh, environment reform is essential in Islam. It's not something any complementary. It's not something complementary. And we should be leaders in that area. Also, we must be active uh, participants, and at least in the significant environmental issues. And not to underestimate, or not under, underestimate our individual uh, daily practices, especially in showers for the youth. Also, learning and applying the sunnah and the teaching of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam in our personal life to live a good and balanced life in the world and the hereafter. Uh, regarding the environment reform, it's a big project, as you see. And it's not enough just an action of one person. We need a collective work. And most of the strategic projects that I covered over here in this series, if you look at it, until now, eight, eight, eight projects. But we have around 10 projects in this series such as the political, economic, social, and environmental projects. All, the, all of them, they need to tackle, we need to tackle them with the Ummah mindset to be more effective, to be more effective, Ummah mindset. We need to focus nowadays on the Muslim community unity here in Canada, the way that the Prophet ﷺ, he focused on it from the first few days when he did the Surah the Salat al-Jama'ah and the Masjid, that was one of the signs for the unity to do that paradigm shift, and also when he did the Brotherhood. Then he started with all the other uh, projects. So we need to do that paradigm shift, the way that we look at our subject and tackle our, our projects and our, our issues. Especially when we talk about tackling significant issues such as Islamophobia, or what they teach our kids in the public schools, or the environment. And we cannot solve these type of issues and achieve a big project with a minority mindset. We need to shift to the Ummah mindset, the way that the Prophet ﷺ he shifted the Sahaba to it from the beginning in the Medina. Regarding Islamophobia, those who are Islamophobic, they don't differentiate between your son and my son. And between the Muslims who pray in Adar or Al-SCCO or MNN or Al-Falah or Ikna, they don't differentiate between that. So we have, yani, we don't, we have, yani, so why we don't work as a whole and as an Ummah? to tackle that subject. We have to complete, we have a complete freedom over here in Canada. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable that why we are not working as an ummah, as, as a group together. And there is no restriction in our religion or even the Canada bylaws to work together as an ummah. The only limitations that we have is in our mind that we imported with us from the inherited local culture that we have our back home that we experience in our countries. We need to look beyond our mosques and our centers and our school walls and beyond even the different organizations' membership. To look beyond that. And we need to break what I call the 21st century's tribal isolation. We isolated ourselves from the Muslim community with these type of you know, organizations. As if we are building another new tribal system over here. We need to deal with each other as we are completing, not competing with each other. And we need to start to, eat, to look at each other in the Muslim community as a valuable resource. The way that the Prophet Sallallahu called the Sahaba, and the Sahaba they learned from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar ibn Khattab, once when he became a Khalifa, he said, Anta ala tabar. He was talking to all the Muslims, not to Abu Bakr and Uthman and Umar and the other, other and Uthman and the other Sahaba, the companions. He was talking to all the Sahaba. Anta ala tabar min tubar al-Islam. You are on one of the loopholes of Islam. So be careful that Islam won't be attacked from, uh, from the area that you guard. I believe one of the first practical steps toward the unity, uh, to, to do the paradigm shift, and to do the communicating, to communicate with each other as an organization, and to sit on one table underneath any umbrella, umma umbrella, for example, and to put one of the big projects such as Islamophobia or what they teach our kids and to work together 
as a group. It's like the teamwork. You can't activate it by khutab or by lectures. We have to practice it. And we have the freedom to do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us at the day of judgment of Allah. Inna Allahumma laika tamu sallu ala nabi Ya ayu saladina ahu sallu alayhi wa sallim taslim Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim taslim kathira Allahumma ja'a ajtima'a ala ajtima'a ala ma'kuma wa ja'a wa tarukhana min ba'di wa tarukha ma'asuma wa la taj'afina wa la madaymina shakiyya wa la ma'huma Allahumma kina li khayri al-amari wa al-aqwal fa innahu la yahdi li khayri ha illa amin اللهم انا نسالك من خير ما سالك من نبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم نعوذ بك من شر ما سالك من نبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم انا نسالك من الخير كل حاجه واجله ما علمنا من ولا نعلم ونعوذ بك من شر كل حاجه واجله ما علمنا من ولا نعلم ان الله يامر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى والعشاء والمنكر والبخل يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله علينا ذكركم فاشكروا على نعم يعذكم فاذكروا الله اكبركم ولا نعم تستعون اخر الساعه الله أكبر الله أكبر